aqui. Thank you so much to the Action Band for honoring us with this 200-year tradition uh, used for opening hunts and festivities here in Poland. May I kindly ask the speakers to come up on stage? Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Global Landscapes Forum. My name is Edinda Hassan, and I'll be your MC today. Before we begin, I'd like to deliver a few housekeeping messages, both to those in the room and those around the world who are watching the live video feed on www.landscapes.org. We are excited to have a significant social media following for the Global Landscapes Forum today. For those of you tweeting the conference, please use the hashtag GLFCOP19. And for those present with us today, there is Wi-Fi in all of the rooms we will be using. Please use the Wi-Fi called GLF Public. The password is globalpub13. And you will have noticed that in an effort to save paper, we've printed only a slim program book. But for the full program and lineup of speakers, we have a smartphone app ready for download and directions to access this app are in your printed guidebook. You can also find all updates on the website. Now, to open the Global Landscapes Forum, we would like to show a short video, an example of the beautiful landscape of Gunung Halimun Salak National Park, which is incredibly only 50 kilometers from Jakarta, one of the largest cities in the world and home to 20 million people. So before we embark on a day of discussion about the landscapes, we would like to give you a taster of one local example that connects to global challenges. Thank you. Taman Nasional Gunung Halimun Salak terdiri dari dua ekosistem, yaitu ekosistem Halimun dan ekosistem Salak. pH-nya itu antara 4 sampai 6, itu cocok sekali untuk teh. 
di sini tanahnya emang bagus untuk di pakai tanaman gitu air juga bagus one of the most strategic factory of Nakua is in, in Gunung Salak kami tinggal dan hidup di atas pegunungan di tengah hutan landscapes mean many things to many people in the past these different aspects of a landscape have been managed in isolation but a shift is happening Conservation organisations, development groups, companies and governments working in the same area are starting to reach out to each other to tackle problems together. So a landscape approach is essentially managing complex landscapes in an integrated fashion, in a holistic fashion, incorporating all of the different land uses within those landscapes into a single management process. We need a landscape approach because there are many different uses of, of our land and our natural resources. And we need to balance these. We need to balance across forestry, across agriculture, water resource management, biodiversity, conservation, and the needs of people. This is uh, Gunan Halimun Salak National Park. Considering we're close to one of the mega cities of the world, Jakarta, it's an amazing repository of, of the last areas of biodiversity of the area. But more crucially, this landscape provides a very important catchment for watersheds and provides most of the water for the entire Jakarta Basin. Javan leopards and gibbons still thrive here, but the park is no remote wilderness. It's located in Indonesia's most populous province and is surrounded by agriculture, plantations, cities and industry. Sebenarnya ada salah satu persepsi bahwa konservasi itu adalah hanya untuk menjaga hutan, satwa seperti itu. Kami katakan sangat tidak mungkin. Artinya kalau hanya berpikir ke arah situ. Dan sudah otomatis kita harus mengakomodir yang namanya kebutuhan hidup. Keberlangsungan keutuhan hutan ini bagi bisnis ya istilahnya saya dan keluarga saya yang ada di sini ya sangat penting sekali dengan adanya. Tapi kalau tanpa adanya hutan ini kemungkinan juga turis itu nggak bakalan banyak yang datang ke sini gitu. The homestays provide income for a few, but most of the communities living in or near the park make their living from agriculture, farming or working on the area's famous tea plantations. Just over the ridge, the Kasepohan traditional community practice rice agriculture. Sebagai keseharian, sebagai titipan, sebagai adat yang harus dilakukan oleh masyarakat adat Banten Kidul. This landscape attracts industries too. Global company Danone Aqua bottles 5 billion litres of water each year in Indonesia. 15% of that comes from the slopes of Mount Salak. Uh, today the quality of the water is very, very good. So this is uh, really protected by the mountain and the forest and the Gunung Salak. Aqua is one of many companies and organisations engaging with the National Park in various conservation and development initiatives, starting the kinds of conversations that are essential for an integrated landscape approach. Of course, it doesn't always go smoothly. Juga tidak bisa dikatakan bagus kalau terlalu menekan kebutuhan masyarakat. Misalnya dengan tidak membolehkan masyarakat menebang untuk kebutuhannya sendiri. Nah, tantangannya tetap pasti ada karena sampai uh, pada saat mengawali kita bagaimana untuk berkolaboratif, artinya uh, perbedaan pendapat itu muncul. Organizations and donors need to be flexible too, as landscapes are constantly changing, while new pressures arise. Itu yang selalu kita khawatir dengan adanya pembalakan liar. Kalau di keseluruhan Halimun gitu, kebanyakan yang kemungkinan sangat cepat mengganggu atau menyebabkan kerusakan itu adalah salah satunya peti penambang mas tanpa izin itu. The biggest threat is changing the the forest into the um, residential land. You need to adapt to those changes, and often projects are constrained by their project document, which says this is what we're going to do in a landscape, and that's sort of followed um, almost to rote. But you can't manage a, a complex landscape like that. You need to have that adaptability and the flexibility to change. It's not easy. But despite the huge range of competing interests, everyone has a stake in ensuring landscapes continue to provide environmental services into the future. Yang harus dijaga yang pertama hutan. Karena hutan selain untuk melindungi kita semua juga untuk mendatangkan air. Elemen yang penting adalah bumi. 
Gunung Hallingman is a very extreme example, if you like, of where we should be applying a landscape approach. It's uh, in an area of extremely high population pressure, um, lots of other pressures on the land, um, but it's an incredibly complex lands landscape because of it. And this is where all of the different interests and stakeholders have to be talking to each other. And this shouldn't just happen uh, on Gunung Hallingman. This is an example of what should be happening in all the landscapes that we're interested in. In terms of the meeting here in Warsaw at the COP, uh, landscape approaches is, is so important because the way we manage landscapes affects both climate mitigation and climate adaptation. The scope of the challenge that we face is enormous. It's global and it's unprecedented. What we need to do is to come together to take the many success stories that we have from all over the world, bring them together, learn from them collectively, and apply them at a global scale. So with that in mind, I'd like to kindly introduce Dr. Lindiwe Sibanda, the CEO of FANRAPAN, who will be our moderator for this session. Dr. Lindiwe is currently coordinating policy research and advocacy programs in Africa aimed at making Africa a food secure region. Thank you. Excellencies here present, our negotiators, distinguished participants, welcome to Global Landscapes Forum. I've been sniffing around. I heard some people, no names mentioned, saying, I enjoyed Forest Day. I also heard others saying, no agriculture, no deal. It's Landscape Forum. In case you're wondering what that is about, we are going to unpack the details, and the video has done justice to that. We are excited to be here collectively to address the world's greatest challenge, climate change. We apologize for the late start. We appreciate that there are people who are still praying for us. Today is Sunday, it's a special day here in Poland. But they are on their way to join us. But we are excited because we have a virtual audience of thousands who are joining us online to enjoy this day with us. Without further ado, I would like to call Dr. Polgram to explain to us where we have been, where we've come from, and where we are going. Peter is the Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research, commonly known as C4. Before he joined C4, he was with the Food Agriculture Organization, where he developed the profile and coordination of POWER's climate change work and made contributions through FAO to the UNFCCC. So we are excited to have a champion unpack Global Landscape Day to us. Thank you. Over to you, Peter. Thank, thank you very much. Good morning. It's really good to see all of you here. And many, many thanks to the government of Poland and University of uh, Warsaw for helping making, making this possible. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, friends of old, an alliance always existed between agriculture and forestry. And now solutions to some daunting challenges depend on us working together. Improving billions of livelihoods to decent standards. Achieving food and nutrition security. Dealing with climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. Safeguarding biodiversity. And achieving that elusive green growth with equity. It is in landscapes we must put our hope. Because in landscapes we have the key to ensure stable income for most poor people. Provide sufficient amounts of food and renewable products. Enhance ecosystem services. And make efficient use of our planet's limited resources. We can only achieve this through combined efforts. Fragmentation is our enemy and a recipe for disasters. Instead, we need convergence of agendas, institutions, and sectors. Convergence of agriculture and forestry, 
convergence of public and private, and convergence of political processes. To get there, we need to think differently, we need to act differently, we need to always keep the big picture in mind and be generous and courageous. Because there will be resistance. Landscapes are weak, they are divided. What hope can we put in them? Sector institutions will claim that their independence is threatened, even if nobody is challenging the roles of the sectors in the landscapes. Experts will claim that the devil is in the details. I say that the details are themselves many times the devil because they obscure the big picture. Interest groups will continue to divide the playing field, for example, by dichotomizing agriculture and forestry. So finding common ground is really crucial. We must prove and communicate, not just to ourselves, but to everyone, that landscapes is the way to go. We need to compare progress in landscapes on very different scales and with very different governance arrangements. We have to share experiences from landscapes and learn from each other. And to do this, we really need a common language with a few generic objectives and a few big picture measures of progress that work everywhere and are understood by everyone. Of course, beyond that common ground, every landscape is unique and must find its own unique solutions. But let's avoid overemphasizing details and differences and instead make the effort to establish similarities in the landscape challenge. Because if we can do this, then we have every opportunity to make a real difference in handling climate change, adaptation and mitigation, and in achieving the future sustainable development goals. And taking steps in that direction is why we're here today. Many would say that landscapes are an important part of the solution. I don't agree. I think that landscapes pretty much are the solution. So an alliance always existed between agriculture and forestry, and we're here to honor that alliance. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I quote, we have an alliance, and the alliance is around Global Landscapes Forum. We have an alliance because we are downplaying our differences and elevating our common objective. What is that common objective? We have nine billion people to feed soon. We can only do it if we are united. Thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here in Poland for a reason. We have lessons to learn because we are dealing with champions, champions in Europe, champions who are involved in protecting the Bison and the last European primeval forests. We want to learn from Poland. We want to understand the challenges that you're facing in combating climate change. We are honored today to have none other than the Minister, Honorable Minister Magini Korolek, who is the Polish Minister of Environment and the President of the UNFCCC COP19. This is an honor, sir. We are grateful. By profession, by training, he is a lawyer, a career civil servant, and a negotiator. His aim is to achieve a balance between the needs of the environment and the economy in order to seamlessly unite environmental protection and economic growth. In his view, environmental protection is an interdisciplinary field, having a direct influence on many other policy areas and being strongly influenced by international arrangements and standards. Here is a champion who will take us to our united objective. Honorable Minister, this is your time. Thank you for the introduction. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so delighted and privileged 
to join the organizers in welcoming you to the first Global Landscape Forum. Forum that just comes in the middle of United Nations Conference on Climate Change. I'm especially pleased and greatly honored to welcome all of you at the University of Warsaw, the prestigious institution hosting us, the university I'm graduating for, from. I'm happy to meet you on the forum, which has evolved from the most influential discussions on forestry and agriculture in climate change context, merging the two dynamic elements under the landscape ap approach sets a very good example of how to advance the, our common actions in shaping the climate and development agenda. But combining the two thematic debates on the sectors so close connected, we have taken the opportunity to perceive forestry and agriculture from a broader perspective. Obviously, we need a holistic tactics such a landscape approach if we want to enhance the effectiveness of our efforts. Without doubts, this can be a step forward on the way to a sustainable world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I certainly do not need to tell you again why it is so critical that we make a rapid progress in this direction. To this to do this effectively requires us to put realistic value on earth vital commodities. This is something that has become even more apparent in the face of gro growing human population. Over time, it has become evident that climate change poses a challenge not only to nature, nature but also to people. One of the most persistent problems in growing enough food while giving a serious consideration to the planet's limited resources. The relevance of climate change problems to societal challenges urge us to ensure that our increasingly stressed ecosystems are sufficiently resilient to cope with our seemingly ever-increasing demands. This way, the poorest people on Earth would ultimately benefit. The landscape approach, embracing the holistic view on the, on the use of natural resources, provide an effective and balanced solutions to pre present the challenges. We can say that landscape is like a household, the strength of which is its bricks. We all know there are a lot of bricks in the world. One of them is the forest. Then let me concentrate on this brick a, a bit longer. It seems to me that there the could be hardly be more important task than safeguarding the worst forests. And it is my hope that the urgency of ensuring their sustainability over the years and decades ahead will be fully recognized around the world. We have the responsibility to protect the rights of generations. The global challenge of climate change required that we ask no less of our leaders, of ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know far better than me than that forests play an absolutely critical role in ensuring the stability of global climate. In this context, I must not for we in this context, we must not forget about stopping global deforestation and reducing greenhouse gases, and this can be achieved by sustainable forest management. Appropriate forest management is essential in maintaining forest multifunctionality, and at the same time, it says a solid element in the pattern of sustainable landscape. On top of all of those reflections, I share the profound conviction that forests are of vital importance due to the linguistic value and that we have a deep responsibility to the natural environment upon which we so wholly and utterly depend. I trust that the inaugural Global Landscape Forum will indicate to the world that will to succeed 
by everyone involved in making progress on the way to the new Global Agreement on Sustainable De Development Goals in 2015. I strongly believe we can together make the world a better and safer place for us and future generations. Poland, as a host country of both COP19 and Global Landscape Forum, will make every effort to support cooperation and common search for the best solutions. I hope that you will find the program interesting and thought-provoking and that the forum will provide you a valuable opportunity to share ideas with other politicians, researchers, practitioners from countries and institutions around the world. I wish every success to organizers and congratulate all who created this event with unique inspiration. I believe that coming days in Warsaw will be crucial not only for us, but also for next generation in Europe and other world continents. I await your conclusions and recommendations which must interest since I am sure they will contribute greatly to your most appreciated effort to shape the climate and development agenda for forests and agriculture. Let me end by expressing my best wishes for the most rewarding meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for those words. I quote, working together, we can make the world a better place for future generations. We thank you for the support, we thank you for the leadership, and we believe we are in good hands. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's now an honor to call on our next speaker and get your shields ready because I'm calling a warrior. If you've been following the news, I read and quote from the latest publication in the financial hub, The Guardian, where the woman I'm introducing is, in, is, is tamed, tamed, not tamed, tamed as a warrior who's spearheading the fight against climate change. Rachel Kite, we are honored. Ladies and gentlemen, the warrior is a woman who fights for women's rights. The warrior is a woman who has founded and led non-governmental organizations that deal with women's rights, with environment and health, and currently, she holds a position as Vice President of Sustainable Development at the World Bank. She's been a champion for researchers chairing the Fund Council for the CGIR, the Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research Centers. But what's exciting to us is that as from next year, it's official. She's moving on to take up the position of Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change. Now, if sustainable development has been difficult for you to spell and pronounce, climate change should be easy. Rachel Kite, this is your time. Well, if I'm a warrior, Lindy, I don't know what you are. Um, Minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Friends, thank you so much for giving the World Bank Group this opportunity to speak with you today. I, we're in a very august university with a long, proud tradition, so I'm going to start with an exercise. For those of you who were in Durban or in Doha, can you put your hands up? Oh, look at that. So everybody who's online, look, they're alive and awake here in the room on a Sunday morning. Okay, well, my message to you is congratulations, you've done it. Here we are at the first Global Landscape Forum. For those of you for whom this is the first exposure to a climate negotiation, um, welcome. We have a long journey to travel together. So I want to congratulate the organizers of this forum for bringing the farm and forest communities together. The future of forests, food and climate are so closely bound that it is vital that we start developing a shared agenda. The tasks before us are daunting and cannot be put off. 
We need to build healthy, productive landscapes, as you saw in the video, that support the livelihoods of billions of people, and we must slow climate change. I think that we're gathered here today to find ways to achieve both at once. Just nine days ago, I was uh, just north of Kasumo, Kasumo in uh, Kenya, on the farm of John Obomo and Pauline, his wife. They, with a lot of help from a lot of the acronyms in this room, were transforming their own lives, certainly transforming the opportunities for their children by managing their landscape in an integrated way. The primary objective was not to reduce emissions. The primary objective was to become food secure, which through genomic research in maize varieties, genomic research in cowpeas and chickpeas and, and, uh, and ground nuts and pawpaws was making it possible. With uh, research in how to uh, conserve water and to irrigate using drop per crop technology was making a difference. That we could take a breed of goat from one side of Kenya, understand it and introduce it into the local population. That we could bring heat resistant sheep to that farm and offer an opportunity for greater wealth. At the same time, the scientists, some of whom are here, are on the ground measuring emissions from this smallholder farm to understand plot by plot what do we know about this triple win, the triple win of managing land so that yield will go up, so that you are food secure, so that income will go up, so that you can put your children in school, and so that emissions will come down. I understand that some of the negotiators here, that they do not yet believe that there is a triple win. I understand that there is skepticism, but you in this room know differently, and it is our collective challenge to bring this evidence and this data to these negotiations and to see a change in the way that we talk about this issue. So I'm inspired by your work. I, like many of you, strongly believe that an integrated landscape approach can help us achieve our twin development and climate goals more effectively. If we continue to fund crop expansion on the one hand and forest protection on the other, we simply waste taxpayers' money. We also waste precious time as a result of a disjointed, discombobulated dance. The latest science shows that we urgently need to turn down the heat. The prospects of a two degree or a three degree warmer world within our lifetimes are real. Agriculture is particularly vulnerable and everybody who depends upon it even more so. Over the next 50 years, climate change could reduce crop yields by 16% and up to 28% in Africa. Increasingly frequent devastating floods and droughts, together with longer term temperature changes, already take a heavy toll on the people who can least afford it. For us at the World Bank Group, we believe that if you don't tackle climate change, we cannot achieve our shared mission with those of our clients to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. For that reason, we are stepping up our mitigation, adaptation and disaster risk management work, redoubling efforts to look at everything we do through a climate lens. We believe that our contribution is to focus on the solutions that make the biggest difference, helping put a price on carbon, supporting the removal of harmful subsidies. And we are deeply committed, therefore, to climate smart agriculture and landscape management approaches. Climate smart agriculture seeks to increase productivity, strengthen farmers' resilience to climate change, reduce emissions, and store more carbon in rural landscapes. It's not a luxury, it's an imperative. We need to reduce the emissions coming from agriculture and associated land use change if we are going to have productive and resilient landscape management, if we are going to feed 9 billion people by 2050. And we will also have to reduce the staggering, staggering amounts of waste in our food supply system. But landscape management, climate smart agriculture is also a huge opportunity because climate change and food security are coming to a dangerous head 
the world's farmers have therefore captured our attention. Every crisis is an opportunity. Let not, let's not waste this one and let's help transform the way that we manage farms and forests together in the wider landscape. Whether it's a high-tech farmer in an industrialized country or a farmer, usually a woman, struggling to produce food in precarious conditions in low-income countries, we have the opportunity to help them now. The question is where to begin, building and standing on your shoulders and everything that you're already doing. Positive change begins with a deeper appreciation for the synergy between human activity and the physical environment. It also takes imagination to move from a predatory situation in which the land is progressively stripped of its natural resources to a model in which human prosperity is built on preserving or enhancing natural wealth. We don't have that system built into our economic models today, but we at the World Bank Group are working on it together with many of you and I think we can get there. One of the great parts of my job is I get to see firsthand, as I did in Kenya just nine days ago, how this can actually work at, at the micro level and the question of how we can scale and speed up the scaling of these successes. One other success within our portfolio is in Ethiopia. It's a work for pay program. It's called the Product Productive Safety Nets Program that's rehabilitated more than 600,000 hectares of degraded lands to date, increasing soil and water conservation through community projects. The immediate goal was to provide work and support to some 8 million rural citizens who were chronically food insecure. But the approach, based on a broad understanding of resilience, is recognized as having boosted Ethiopia's natural capital and capacity to adapt to climate change. What makes these kinds of solutions stick? Simply put, development and climate change interventions work when people on the ground reap tangible benefits. And of course, when you're working on the ground, you don't call them climate change and development interventions. In Costa Rica, what we would call climate smart techniques work very well for ranchers and farmers. By planting or preserving tree, farmers, can shade, for farmers provide shade for cattle and coffee. By maintaining those trees along stream beds, they protect the natural water resources. By growing nitrogen fixing grasses and rotating the cows in their pastures, the ranchers are saving on cow feed and fertilizer. The trees that store carbon and provide wildlife habitats also earn them carbon credits. It's a wonderful system in which the farmer's self-interest reinforces behavior that benefits the broader collective. The farmers I met in Kenya were not practicing climate smart agriculture to reduce greenhouse gases, nor should they have to worry about emissions generated on other continents by big polluters. Their concerns were more immediate, how to feed their children, how to educate their children, how to manage when rain patterns are increasingly erratic, how to cultivate the land when soil and water are washed away into deep gullies. By switching from growing maize to intercropping vegetables and fruit trees, the farmers in the pilot program I visited were able to triple their income. In a part of the world where almost half the children under the age of five are malnourished, that is a powerful incentive. That is something that we can all agree about. If practiced on a large enough scale, in combination with upstream interventions to better regulate water flows, tree planting, conservation agriculture, contour farming, could start to repair landscapes such as the ones that I've seen. Large-scale farmer-assisted restoration has happened elsewhere and resulted in impressive long-term economic and environment gains. So the question that we have to ask ourselves here better than anywhere else is what is stopping us? If simple techniques are known to increase farmers' productivity, save money, heal the environment. Why are climate smart techniques not conquering the land at scale today? In our contemporary high-tech society, it's tempting to think that the secret of success is simply good design. Climate smart solutions will spread and gain momentum on their own because they're smart. Yet we know from personal experience that there are plenty of healthy, rational choices that fall by the wayside unless there is a supportive and enabling environment. 
Yields are only one dimension in the decision-making process of farmers. We need to get a whole set of incentives right to support people in making sustainable livelihood choices. Although the benefits of climate smart systems are impressive, the transition to sustainable productive systems can entail significant expense, especially initially when farmers forego income from old activities and before positive returns from the new systems materialize. You are seeking leaders in a community that are prepared to take a leap and try something new. Coordinating actions across landscapes also requires investments in time and social capital, which farmers may simply not have. We need to learn more about what drives the successful adoption of climate smart practices and be prepared to support the shift through public funding. The Terra Africa Partnership has found that insecure land tenure, lack of capital and limited farm inputs are barriers to the adoption of conservation agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. Studies suggest that when land rights are more secure, farmers will be more likely to take long-term risks and invest in their plots. As a result, productivity increases. Clearly, and I think we all know this, we need to make land tenure a central part of the landscape agenda if we're serious about addressing food security and climate change and seeing irreversible progress. So if we're going to talk about land tenure, then we have to talk about gender. Tackling gender inequality head on, full on, is our responsibility. This is not a token issue. Because women farmers produce as much as 80% of most crops in most low-income countries, but have more limited assets than men, facilitating their access to land, their access to capital, will be a fundamental game changer. In Ethiopia, again, besides the Work for Cash program that I mentioned, the key to reviving agriculture in the region may have been a land certification effort that reassured farmers that their land would not be taken from them without compensation and gave women for the first time a right to half the marital land. In the words of Tasheku Waratah, a woman farmer with a hectare of land, one hectare of land, she said that before getting the certificate in my name, it was just socially understood that the land belonged to my husband. If anything happened, I was supposed to leave home without having anything of our common property. After receiving the land certificate, Tosheku planted trees, used part of the land to grow grass to fatten her livestock. For women farmers like her, confidence in property rights was a prerequisite to investing in change. It's also a prerequisite to getting access to credit. You have to have something to collateralize if you are going to grow your assets. Gender not only changes the way we think of who and how we manage the land, it will change our research priorities too. At the country level, the best laid plans for climate smart and equitable growth can only go so far if land governance and law enforcement are too weak in the face of powerful interests. Working across sectors to improve watershed management trying to rationalize land use in areas where forestry concessions, mining permits, nature reserves, and agricultural activity frequently clash and overlap is extremely challenging in the absence of credible rules, public maps, access to data. Together with FAO and others, we at the World Bank see a strong link between the responsible governance and tenure of land, fisheries and forests, and sustainable development outcomes. If we have clear land tenure and, and commitment to transparent markets and the rule of law, we can consistently attract better quality long-term investors than countries with opaque rules. Companies too are starting to feel the rewards of aligning their corporate behavior with their objectives of return over the long run. All because supply, supply chains um, do better with transparent market regulation. We can have better competition and price premiums attached to voluntary certificate schemes. The threat of negative publicity, resulting losses in market share, has done a lot to encourage better land stewardship 
and responsible business conduct. But the business driver for corporates today is access to a secure, sustainable, predictable supply chain. And this is driving corporate behavior the world over. I talked at the beginning about the skepticism of some of the negotiators that a triple win exists, that we can increase yields, that we can increase incomes, and that we can mitigate climate change from better landscape management approaches, from climate smart agriculture. You know, in Durban, we managed to get agriculture on the negotiating agenda. In Doha, we took a glancing blow with a bit of a setback. And I've just read the language that emerged from Substar at three o'clock in the morning. And we've taken another blow. I think that this is a particular setback for the continent of Africa, for whom an integrated approach to these issues is so important. So I understand the skepticism, but I would ask negotiators to pay attention. I would ask all of us to do whatever we can to take each one of those negotiators and the ministries to whom they report and sit down with them and explain to them what science is showing. Tell them about all of the examples where we can see that it's working today and talk about the consequences of not incorporating this into the negotiating agenda. Punting climate smart agriculture negotiations from Substa 38 to Substa 39 to Substa 40 means that these negotiations run the risk of turning their backs on some of the most vulnerable and the poorest people in this world. And that will not build a climate negotiation that works. I don't just stand here and say this. In the World Bank Group, we are absolutely committed to everything we can do to support this agenda. And we offer our help and our support to every negotiating team if they wish to understand further how we think that this is something that can benefit all and make the climate negotiations stronger. And it won't just be us, it will be us and every one of our partners in this room. So this is an offer of help. It's not a castigation of what has happened. To Let's just turn a page here in Warsaw and decide that over the next 12 months, we're really going to deal with this seriously. We have more tools than ever before to quantify and visualize the connections between human activities and the environment. From crowdsourcing to satellite imagery, from natural capital accounting to participatory mapping, we have more data, more resources, more images, more evidence. We have great research from across the globe, represented in this room and at this conference. We have large-scale examples even of triple wins. So what's missing? Do we need to hone our message? Are we spending too much time talking to each other? Are we spending too much time painting a picture of climate gloom and land use trade-offs? Is the price of carbon or the lack of one keeping us down? I hope this first ever Global Landscapes Forum will generate the enthusiasm, the steady exchange of ideas among farmers, investors, planners, researchers, the development community, men and women, to kick off climate smart agriculture in a big way. Let's make the most of our moment in the limelight. Let's make things right for farmers and the planet. And let's start here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the warrior has spoken. We are guilty for turning our backs on the most vulnerable. Climate smart agriculture is real. It is not a luxury, it is an imperative. Negotiators, if you are still skeptical, go to Kisomo village in Kenya and see the climate smart agriculture villages and get first-hand experiences from the people we are working to help. It is not for us, it is for them. They are not here, we are privileged to be here. So let's be true to the cause that we are working for. We are wasting time, 
we are wasting money by separating food from forestry. It is therefore my honor to call upon the next speaker from the Food Agriculture Organization, who holds the position of Head of Forestry Department at FAO. I am aware that the big chief at FAO, Dr. Graziano, is fighting for Africa's Zero Hunger Initiative. Forests have the answer, agriculture has the answer, landscapes are the way to go. Sir, this is your time. Honorable Minister Korolek from Poland and President of the COP19, Dr. Peter Holmring, Director General of C4, Ms. Anne Tutweiler, Director General of Biodiversity International, and my former boss, uh, Russell Kite, Vice President of Sustainable Development at the World Bank, Vice Rector of the University of Warsaw, Ms. Dr. Ruth de Vries, uh, Professor from the Earth Institute, Honorable Ministers, heads of agencies, distinguished delegates to the COP. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, bonjour, buenos dias. It's not easy to address you after the inspiring leadership words of Rachel Kite, but I will try to provide a few additional issues. And allow me to welcome you to the Global Landscape Forum, the GLF, on behalf of the two forum organizing partners, the Collaborative Partnership on Forests on one side, and the Agriculture and Rural Development Consortium. As chair of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, the CPF, a mechanism that includes 14 international organizations with a global mandate and substantial programs on forests, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of the partners of both consortia and thank them for their extensive efforts over the last year to make this new event happen. I would like to express our gratitude to the government of Poland in the person of the Minister of Environment to the University of Warsaw for hosting here, and also especially to Professor Piotr Paschalis for the crucial support provided for facilitating the extraordinary facilities for the forum at the University of Warsaw. Allow me as well to recall the excellent work conducted by CFOR's Communication Director, John Colming. Finally, I would like to recall Jan McAlpine, the Director of the United Nations Forum on Forest, until last Friday, that would have loved to attend as she did it to all the six previous forest days, but one was unable to assist due to personal reasons. As you will recall, the mandate of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests is to support the implementation of the International Arrangement on Forests, the UNFF process, and coordinate forest activities in order to synergize its work and deliver as one. This mechanism is one of the most advanced of the, its kind in the UN system, and eventually it may be a source of experience for the proposal that Russell Kite just launched to us today. Over the last 10 years, the CPF has been implementing initiatives that are championed by one or more of its partners. Nearly seven years ago, in a moment where many argued for a more central role of vegetation, and very especially of forest, in the climate change negotiations after a very weak outcome in Kyoto, CIFO proposed the CPF to arrange the first Forest Day event. Forest Day has been catalytic in joining the dispersed voices on forest and vegetation role in climate change and was influential in the process that led to the Red Plus discussion, decisions emerging from the COP13 negotiations in Bali. Similarly, as agriculture became a more central issue in the climate change debates, the first Agriculture and Rural Development Day was convened in 2009 and, uh, in lead of the COP15 in Copenhagen, and further days followed. Many of you have also attended the Agriculture, Landscape and Livelihood Dates, or AL5, last year in COP18 in Doha. The convening of these days have, been, have had an impact on decisions taken both in the SABSTA and in other intergovernmental negotiation processes, including the outcomes of Rio Plus 20. During 2012, with a little friendly prompting, a discussion started in both organizing consortia on, on whether to create a joint event containing elements of the Agriculture and Rural Development Day, the Forest Day, and as well the Mountain Day organized by the Mountain Partnership. Emerging public and research interests began to recall the need for a landscape approach to consider the linkages between the agriculture and forest sectors and their connections to fragile ecosystems such as mountains and drylands. 
This sparked the need for a new type of international event at COP. Again, C4 was crucial to this change and supported by the World Bank and very specially by Russell Kite, it would join the efforts of the consortia and constituencies behind interested in the landscape approach to form a new event, the Global Landscape Forum. We are opening today. The need for a landscape approach is not a new one. Watershed approaches have contributed to forest science from its very beginning. In 1824, where a corps of engineers des eaux et forêts was established in Nassi, France. There is a growing understanding that a common approach to many related issues, such as tenure, land use planning, sustainable land management, disaster risk reduction through prevention, and very especially in mountain areas, preservation of biological diversity, soil and water protection, fighting against desertification, landscape values, and the enhancement and optimizing of sustainable production in a given landscape is due. Exactly this approach is the leitmotiv of the innovative nature of the Global Landscape Forum, including by integrating issues like food security that are very hot and very high in the political agenda. By integrating agriculture, forests, mountains, and rural development, the Global Landscape Forum ensures a rural approach that is urgently needed in a world progressively urbanizing. Rural areas lag behind urban ones in living conditions. Initiatives like the Global Landscape Forum can help to achieve the political momentum needed to overcome the progressive marginalization dependent by the scattered administrative sectoralization. The debate on food security and nutrition is also changing. We are moving to a more holistic and systemic approach that considers the contribution of forests and other natural resources to food security, including the direct contributions like meat, honey, fruits, seeds, and other non-wood forest products, the indirect, like firewood, we need to cook the uh, food we eat, pollinization, a crucial issue, and fodder, especially in dry lands and dry periods, and as well, environmental services that ensure clean and fresh water and soil protection. The International Conference on Forests for Food Security and Nutrition, held last May in FAO headquarters, in deep cooperation with many of the partners present here today was a milestone in this regard. The conference also called for improved data collection at national and international levels. In this context, the CPF has recently initi initiated a global scientific assessment on forest and food security in the framework of its global forest expert panel initiative led by UFRO in order to inform the relevant discussions on the post-2015 development agenda. The discussions on the post-2015 development agenda are progressing quickly. It remains to be seen how the landscape elements such as agriculture, forest, mountains, land degradation and desertification, climate change, biodiversity, bioenergy and disaster risk reduction will be incorporated into the future sustainable development goals. It is important, however, that we work to achieve a balanced approach to these issues one that does not prioritize one sector's policies over the others and highlights the interlinkages of them. Such an approach would need to be based in three basic elements. First, the contribution of natural resources to environmental, social, and economic development, a so-called downstream perspective. On the other hand, the economic returns provided in order to enable the resource to answer to the complex social demands, including the necessary investments in degraded ecosystem, the so upstream perspective, and all of that embraced by a consistent governance mechanism that arbitrates competing demand, demands, adjusting them to the present carrying capacity of the resource. On behalf of the Collaborative Partnership on Forest, we look forward to the discussions today and wish you all an inspiring new experience that we hope will contribute to the UN sustainable development process and the sound agreement on climate change, both in 2015, in the second case in Paris. Allow me to recall that in 2015 as well, Expo Milan will offer the opportunity to showcase the world food from a 360 degrees perspective in the wake of this global landscape forum. As Commissioner General of the UN for Expo 2015, I invite you all to take advantage of this opportunity. Thanks for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much to Mr. Eduardo Rogers Brales for highlighting our shortcomings. We've been good at tackling one problem and worsening the other. 
We've been good at increasing yield at the expense of nutrition, at the expense of our environment, at the expense of biodiversity conservation. We need to take a holistic approach and landscape approach is what's on the table for us. It's therefore fitting to call our next speaker, Dr. Anne Tetweiler, who is the Director General of Bioversity International, an international research uh, for development organization that is a member of the CGIR consortium. Anne is a champion who's been working on forging effective research partnerships and overseeing the organization's strategic priorities and the research agenda. And this is your time. Thank you, Lindy Wei. Ladies and gentlemen and excellencies, good morning. I also want to extend my thanks to the Polish government and the University of Warsaw for, for providing such excellent facilities. I remember being at uh, the Rio Plus 20 conference two years ago at the Agriculture and Rural Development Day when one of our previous speakers, Rachel Kite, said, I want this to be the last Agriculture and Rural Development Day. From now on, I want to see a landscapes forum. So a little more than a year later, we are here celebrating the opening of the first landscapes forum. This is an unparalleled meeting because of the breadth and number of policymakers, global experts, donors, the private sector, community groups, and others that have come together to discuss and explore the role of landscapes in achieving our common goals of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. This meeting is also important because we need an integrated and inclusive approach to address the challenges we face moving beyond zero-sum strategies that tackle one problem and worsen another, as we have just heard from Eduardo. The landscape approach offers this opportunity. Landscapes are the stage where sectors and disciplines meet. They are where people engage with their surroundings to provide for their families, where they access productive land and clean water, where they find protection from natural hazards, and a safe space for personal growth and development. I want to talk this morning about the important role that agricultural biodiversity plays in helping improve landscape management, food security, and nutrition while satisfying the needs of farmers and society as a whole. At present, of the more than 50,000 edible plant species in the world, only a few hundred contribute significantly to the food supply. And just a few crops, wheat, rice, and maize, account for almost 50% of the entire calories that we as a world consume. Over the years, the uh, consultative group on international agricultural research has invested quite a bit in these crops. And even this year, we, we look at, at the budget of the CGIR and realize about half of the CG's budget goes into the production to, to research for these crops. Imagine what we can do if we put more research dollars into the issues we are discussing here today. For a long time, we thought the resolution of hunger problems was an arithmetic equation. If we produce more food, if we increase productivity, we solve hunger. We are now realizing we're dealing with calculus. In order to reduce hunger, we need to not only increase productivity, we also need to improve nutrition, livelihoods, natural resource management, while reducing the impact of climate change. We need to refocus our agendas, we need to re-energize our research agenda, and recognize the important role of landscapes and of agricultural biodiversity in those landscapes. I'd like to give a few examples of the role that agricultural biodiversity plays in contributing to this um, solution of a calculus problem. Minor millets, for example, are a resilient plant that needs very little care, grows in marginal areas where major crops often fail, contains protein levels that are close to those of wheat, 
rich, the, it is rich in vitamin B, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, and zinc. Yet, minor millets account for less than 1% of the food grains produced in the world. Agricultural biodiversity also provides important ecosystem services, such as pollination, pest control, and healthy soils. It also includes the services beyond production that agriculture provides to the borders of the farm, such as clean water and climate change mitigation. For example, the diversification of land use and ecosystems provides a buffer against weather-related stress as crops adapt to changing climate, boosting resilience. In many parts of the world, small-scale farmers continue to cultivate traditional varieties and diverse crops to reduce risks associated with climate change. In northern Ethiopia, for example, farmers who face high rainfall variability plant more teff, barley, and grass pea rather than wheat and lentils, and they often plant different varieties of, within the same species. Diverse crop and land use also ensures soil regeneration and fertility over time. It attracts and sustains a variety of pollinators that contribute to the production of over 75% of the world's most important crops. Biodiversity is one of the best ways of achieving results in pest and disease control, as predators and organisms keep these in check. The lady beetle, for example, which eats cotton aphids, has been estimated to save nearly $5 per 100 cotton plants, according to a recent study in China. In Ecuador, a project which my organization is involved in, we've discovered that when farmers plant many different varieties of beans in their field, they can reduce the losses to pests and disease by down to 2%. And we, we find similar examples in Africa where there's less diversity being planted, where losses are close to 20%. So a simple move of planting more diverse varieties of, a, of one crop in a field ha can have a tremendous impact on reducing uh, pests and losses. Last year, my organization, in conjunction with FAO, the Convention on Biodiversity, the International Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, MBRAPA, the private sector, the World Bank, and others launched a new initiative called the Bridging Agriculture and Conservation Initiative, trying, which is essentially another way to talk about a landscape approach by bringing together the goal, the, the, the actors in the conservation and agriculture sector, each of them recognizing they can't achieve their goals without the other, without finding these synergies that we have been talking about this morning. Let me close with an example of biodiversity's integral role in the landscape approach. In Begnas, Nepal, it's a, there's a group of mountain villages where we have worked over the past 10 years. The specific lessons and practices in managing mountain landscapes have been distilled and documented with support from the landscapes for people and nature. The Begnas landscape has recently been declared an agricultural biodiversity conservation area by local authorities. Here, forests have been restored and sustainably managed by community members. As a result of their reforestation activities, the forest cover has improved and households can easily get sufficient fuel and fodder through regulated use of these resources. Fisheries, goat rearing, vegetables, and crop production are integrated at the household level, spreading risk over various crops and foodstuffs. The Rupa Cooperative, which manages fisheries in the lake, is monitoring the use of pesticides in the watershed and is promoting reforestation in surrounding communities to curb pollution. Upstream communities of the lake are provided with social and financial support to ensure that downstream communities also are benefiting. The switch to perennial crops and fruits is on the rise due to greater market value, lower labor requirements, and greater tolerance to weather stress. Moreover, the network of fruit orchards and agroforestry systems within the landscape add to its structural complexity and provide environmental services, including soil erosion control. In conclusion, if we want to deliver nutritious food to a growing population, alleviate poverty, respect the environment, and adapt to changing climate, we must do so with an integrated vision. 
Biodiversity is our partner in this endeavor. We have heard that a post-2015 climate agreement may integrate agriculture and forestry issues, and the discussions on the Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda have stressed the need for cross-cutting solutions. The timing and awareness is ripe for new solutions and broader acceptance of the role of agricultural biodiversity in a landscape approach. To secure a sustainable path, stakeholders, sectors, and solutions must come together to inform policy and to mainstream landscape approaches that champion synergies and resilience for our growing population and changing environmental needs. I look forward to the progress toward that end that this event will achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Anne for unpacking for us what biodiversity has to give in our landscape approach. We cannot just talk about reducing hunger without talking about improving nutrition, without talking about enhancing livelihoods, without talking about adapting and mitigating clim to climate change. It's a holistic approach. If you are still skeptical, go to Nepal, go to Africa, talk to the real people. The science has been put to bear. We need negotiators who use evidence in their engagements. It's all on the table for you. It's now my pleasure to call upon our final speaker, Professor Ruth De Vries, who is a distinguished professor of sustainable development, professor of ecology, evolution, and environmental biology at the Eth Institute, Columbia University. Ruth is exemplary in her work, and she's going to unpack to us how best do we look beyond the silos? How best do we use the evidence to inform policy? And how do we move forward in making sure the research is collectively addressing the challenge we face of feeding 9 billion by 2050? Over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Director General, Your Excellencies, delegates, colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this truly groundbreaking event. It is particularly an honor to participate in this first forum on landscapes. The shift from individual agricultural day and forest day events, as we've heard, to this Global Landscape Forum signifies an evolution of approaches and possibilities much greater than a simple name change might imply. Forest Day was born out of the recognition of the important roles that forests play in climate mitigation and adaptation, livelihoods, and humanity's stewardship of the planet. After several years of many successful forest days and the rise of forests to a prominent place on the international climate agenda, and Agriculture Day to highlight the role of agriculture in uh, adaptation and mitigation. This Global Landscape Forum brings together a common view on the part of scientists and decision makers that successful forest management cannot happen in a vacuum, uh, that forest management is an essential but insufficient need to achieve sustainable development. Forests sit within larger landscapes of which they are part, and management of forests affects landscapes beyond forests. A focus on a landscape perspective broadens our thinking to consider how local communities, districts, municipalities, states, provinces, national governments, and international policy can manage landscapes to foster the well-being of people, promote adaptation and mitigation, and maintain other functions, such as protecting watersheds, providing habitats for other species. As a representative of science on this, plan on this panel, I'd like to outline some of the current understanding and open questions that might help inform management of landscapes for healthy planet and healthy people. First, what is a landscape? Sounds like a simple question, but it's actually quite a difficult question to answer. 
we are learning that we have to abandon our notions of precise boundaries on maps, like administrative boundaries or even watershed delineations. Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, one of the few at his, of his time who could gain the perspective from above that is so common today from airplane windows and Google Earth, said, life is like a landscape. You live in the midst of it, but can describe it only from the vantage point of distance. From a distance, we can see how places are connected through flows of water, migration patterns of animals, movement of people, and trades of goods. So we might think of a landscape as the entity that captures these connections on the ground. The landscape defining Warsaw, for example, the city where we are having this meeting, might include the food shed that supplies the city with food or the watershed that provides water. The landscape around a park might include the range of a species of interest, uh, such as the greater Yellowstone ecosystem defined to encompass the range of the grizzly bear. While it's tempting to try to draw a well-defined boundary to define landscapes, a landscape approach needs to identify the area of focus based on the reality of how any particular place interacts with its surroundings to deliver food, water, and whatever functions might be important for that place. Let's take two large-scale examples. We've heard many examples of how critical a landscape approach is for a poor, vulnerable farmers, and absolutely, we have no doubt that that is true. But a landscape approach is important for everyone, no matter if we live in cities, towns, or on a rural farm, our survival depends on uh, landscapes. In that spirit, I offer these two larger scale examples. Uh, one is the well-known example of uh, the watershed in uh, New York City, where I live. Going back to the mid-1800s, when the first reservoirs were built north of the city, the connection between water for the city and the upstream watershed was the basis for managing the landscape. Of course, there were, and still are, competing demands on the landscape, forests to deliver clean water to the reservoirs that supply the city, farms that provide food and support livelihoods, and development around a large urban center. In the 1990s, federal regulations that would require a multi-billion dollar filtration plant in the absence of land management to keep sediments and pollutants out of the water led to partnerships and incentives to keep land in forest and manage farms to reduce runoff of pollutants. The ability of the landscape to deliver clean water to the city ultimately depends on how individuals manage their land and the incentives they have to do so. While we might consider a landscape approach to be a new concept, in this example, the idea of a landscape that is managed to provide multiple functions goes back quite a long time. A more recent example of a large-scale landscape perspective is the successful reduction in deforestation achieved in the last eight or so years in the Brazilian Amazon even considering the recent reported increase. The decline was particularly dramatic in the southeastern part of the Amazon in the state of Mato Grosso. This is a landscape that is connected through international exports to Europe and more recently to Asia. So we cannot think of this landscape in isolation of the demands for these products in faraway places. Before the dramatic downswing in deforestation, the primary function for that landscape was to provide meat of one sort or another, either as cattle directly or soy to feed livestock. As the functions provided by forests, carbon stored in the biomass, water cycled through trees, habitat for biodiversity, were added to the agenda, the policy shifted. Incentives, monitoring, and enforcement worked together to keep forests standing. The result was an incredible drop in deforestation. But the reduced deforestation was not at the expense of production. Production of both cattle and soy continued to climb. More intensive use of low productivity lands made a multifunctional landscape possible. The landscape went from an almost sole function, uh, focus on one function, meat for exports, to multiple functions, meat, stored carbon, and forests to maintain a healthy climate. 
What might these examples have in common? They are in very different parts of the world with different economies, cultures, and ecological settings. But both of these landscapes faced external pressures to manage for more than one function. The external force for the New York watershed to, maintain, to manage for clean water came from top-down regulations. The external force for reduced deforestation in Mato Grosso partly came from the demand for importers for deforestation-free soy. Also, in both cases, the solutions to these top-down external forces were bottom-up. In the New York watershed, local organizations worked with landowners to manage their runoff. In Mato Grosso, the growers themselves took on the responsibility for ensuring that soy is produced from lands that are not newly deforested with the well-known soy moratorium that is now the example for uh, beef, oil palm, and other commodities. This combination of top-down forces with bottom-up solutions possible on the ground in real places with real people managing their parcels of land occurred in both of these examples. The two cases also share a common characteristic that land ownership, land tenure, is relatively well-defined compared with many other places in the world, as we heard so eloquently from uh, Rachel, how essential that aspect is. As more studies and examples of landscape management for multiple functions are analyzed, we will learn more about the generalizable characteristics that make success possible. Of course, a landscape approach that considers multiple functions of landscapes is not the norm in most places. The highest economic return or the strongest political clout is most often the factor that determines the functions that take priority. In most places where people use landscapes, the primary function is to prov provide food, timber, or some other agricultural commodity. And that's for good reason. Food is clearly the most fundamental need for people. The decades since the 1960s have seen the greatest increase in the amount of food produced than ever before, mainly from fertilizers, irrigation, better seeds, and other inputs to produce more from the same amount of land. The looming question is how landscapes might continue to intensify to provide food in the future while achieving other functions like protecting watersheds, providing habitat, protecting against storm surges, and supporting forest-dependent livelihoods. One notion argues that if more food is produced from less land, then some land can be left for the other functions, the so-called land-sparing approach. Evidence indicates that this can indeed be the case, but only with strong policies to control deforestation and land clearing. Otherwise, the overpowering incentive works in the other direction. The more intensive production, the more economic benefit, and the greater the incentive to clear. As the world becomes more urban, the imperative to manage landscapes as whole entities with multiple functions grows even stronger counterintuitively. By the middle of this century, close to 70% of people are projected to be living in cities, with the most rapid urban growth in the developing world. In many ways, we can look upon this urbanization in a positive light that allows people to achieve higher standards of living and gain access to more opportunities. But growing cities and towns mean that food, water, and energy will come from landscapes distant from these population centers. Urban areas themselves occupy only a small percentage of the landscape, but the urban arm is now a major force for change in landscapes. The competing demand on landscapes for food, watershed protection, climate regulation, energy production, conservation, and tourism will only intensify. We are already seeing these competing demands in many places. So there really is not much choice for scientists and policymakers but to develop the tools and the on-the-ground knowledge to manage landscapes that perform multiple functions. History shows that creative juices start to flow when crises demand solutions. We are far from a clear path to resolving competing objectives and implementing multiple functions everywhere. There are many messy realities, but landscape level management can, with hard work, become more common, however unrealistic that might look from where we currently sit. There can be no single prescription for managing multifunctional landscapes in all places. Each place has its ecology, culture, and competing demands. 
In some places, the important functions might be protection against storms. In others, habitat for diversity or carbon storage above or below ground. And in others, production of food or fiber. What can be a common thread is the approach to explicitly identify the multiple functions that might be important in any particular place to particular stakeholders and to identify potential pathways to realize those functions. The two examples of the New York watershed and the Brazilian success in reducing deforestation and others that many of you have shared in the sessions show that it is possible to bring together competing interests to achieve multiple objectives. But there is much science to be done to sort out how most effectively these multiple functions might be achieved and even more hard work on the part of the policy to provide the right set of incentives. There have been great advances in identifying from satellite imagery, land cover changes around the world. Just yesterday's issue of Science Magazine, for example, has a spectacular technical result from mapping global changes in forest cover annually since 2000. Our challenge is to take these technical achievements and use them to help manage landscapes. In particular relevance for this meeting, Mitigating and adapting, adapting to climate change calls for a landscape approach. Agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gases, first through releasing carbon stored in biomass to the atmosphere in the process of clearing. Secondly, through methane from ruminant livestock and rice paddies and nitrous oxide from fertilizer. Management to minimize these emissions needs to be part of any mitigation strategy. Less clear, but equally important, is the potential for landscape management to foster climate adaptation through altering microclimate, for example, or providing buffers against intensifying storms. In summary, from the science side, there are many open questions, starting with the criteria to define a landscape, including the ecological and institutional factors that can make a landscape approach successful in provo promoting multifunctional landscapes, the role of landscapes in an urban world, and effective landscape designs for mitigating and adapting to climate change. Addressing these questions is not science as usual. Rather, it requires an on-the-ground approach that cuts across ecological, economic, cultural, and political dimensions. Nor is the approach policy as usual. It requires navigating across often distinct sectors of agriculture, forestry, environment, and development. To turn back to the topic of this weekend's forum, I congratulate C4 on starting down this path to bring together this wonderfully diverse group of people to get down to the hard work of considering how to turn lofty goals into on-the-ground reality to manage landscapes for people to be healthy, nourished, prosperous, and secure in their environments. Wish you the best success for the day and the coming discussions about landscape approaches and moving forward. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ruth for unpacking the science in a simple way. My take home message from that is that uh, addressing climate change through a landscape lens calls for science, but not science as usual. It calls for new policies, but not policy as usual. There is no blanket solution Landscapes have multiple functions. Food is the most paramount that we know of, but we need to adapt and mitigate climate change. Thank you very much, Ruth, for that inspiring overview. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that my panelists have tried. We started 40 minutes late, and we are ending the session just before 11. We try to catch up on time, but we are in it together. I'd like you to join me in thanking the speakers for unpacking the day for us and preparing us for subsequent sessions. 
It's been a pleasure being your facilitator. Thank you very much for the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lindiwe, and indeed our distinguished uh, speakers. And we want to thank you as well for your patience. I understand that we did start a bit late, and we do understand that the negotiations ended very late last night also. Um, but we do want to stay on time and continue with the sub-plenary sessions at 11. Um, unfortunately, this means that the press conference will be cancelled, but there have been individual requests by press to have... Um, interviews with some speakers and we do ask that you take your refreshments immediately to the next session. Um, most of them are in this building so there is refreshments on this on the right side and on the left side um, and there is one sub plenary session organized by CCAS and CTA in the old library building. There are refreshments there as well for you to take. Thank you.